Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for uh, the Eornar, which is episode 14 of season 4 of Star Trek Enterprise. This video is a part of a series of videos where I review episodes as determined by my user polls. The episode to win my latest Enterprise user poll is the Eornar. So the Eornar is the third part, or epilogue, however you choose to call it, of the three-parter about the... Um, Romulans trying to start a war between the Thelarites and the Andorians by using uh, drones. So, in my opinion, this storyline was resolved in the second part, which is why I'm in counting. I'm reviewing this as its own episode because this deals with the aftermath of how the um, them discovering who piloted the drone that uh, started all this was actually an Eornar, which is a subspecies of the Andorian. So they travel to Andoria um, to try to enlist help with the Eornar, and they find the uh, pilot's sister is willing to help them, and she uses her telepathic abilities to help Enterprise um, find and stop this pilot before uh, he causes any more damage, including destroying Enterprise. So, yeah, as I said, <laughs> I kind of, <clears throat> I usually like to review two-parters and even three-parters together. Like, with Enterprise Season 4, it's it's made up of mostly three-parters and two-parters. And previous three-parters, like the Vulcan trilogy and the, um, the one with the augments, <clears throat> I just reviewed all three episodes in one video, but I've decided not to do that here. When the ENR was selected as the um, one of my random selections, I decided instead of saying, Oh, I'm just gonna review all three, I decided to review this as its own episode. Now, if I do <coughs> eventually cover uh, United and Babylon 1, I will probably review both of those together because I do really see that as one episode or one story stretched over two episodes, just like I saw the Vulcan trilogy, the um, Kirshar one, I felt like that was one story stretched over three episodes, whereas this, I think, is is not really one story stretched over three episodes, it's one story stretched over two, but then they have the epilogue or the dealing with the aftermath that comes right after it. So that's personally how I, this is very subjective, <clears throat> and that's just personally how I look at it. So this is, that's how I choose to review it. So that's, that's my <laughs> decision, because I think I can look on this episode as its own thing. Whereas if I were to re review something like United, I couldn't look on it as its own. For me, I would have to combine that with Babylon 1. That's just my thinking. Anyway, the funny thing about that is is that I actually think I do enjoy this episode more out of context. Now, I talked about that recently with some other Star Trek reviews, and it's funny. It's a funny thing to say about this, which is technically the third part in a three-parter, that I actually like it better out of context. Now, because I... Gotta be honest, for the longest time, I didn't think very highly of this episode, especially when I first saw it, and so I had bad memories of it. <clears throat> so I always used to put it as one of the poorer episodes of season four of Enterprise. Because um, I remember when I first saw this three-parter, I was really disappointed because it is a massive shift in tone from the other two-parter. And really, and I do think I think better of the whole thing if I just think of that you know, those other two episodes as his own two-parter and this as an epilogue. It actually, I don't know why, but for some reason in my mind, it makes me think higher of not only this episode, but the whole thing. And I do think this is um, an epilogue because I think the main story in the last two episodes, that is of, uh, will there be a conflict between uh, the Dorians and the Tellarites and Archer like having to deal with Shran, being upset over losing his wife and um, the Romulan drone, which Reed and Tucker were trapped on, trying to destroy all the ships, like all that. I think was resolved in the episode before this. So I, so I think that is all that, that was all done in this two part where this dealt with sort of the aftermath. It dealt with well, what about that pilot who is revealed to be Andorian? Um, and what about that drone is still out there and the Romulans could still cause trouble? So 
I, I really, and I actually think, I, I think a lot more highly about it if I do see this as its own separate story. And I really think that it is. Now, also what I meant by massive change in tone and probably part of the reason why I didn't like this episode when I first saw it is because those that two-parter was a very good two-parter and I'll get to it eventually the Babylon one and United um, but it was very action oriented it was very suspense heavy it was in it was very good in that regard so I think coming from that and thinking that this would just be part three of that um, that's probably why I was disappointed because I was expecting that same tone and the massive shift tone made me think, well, this is just boring. <laughs> like this, this is a boring reference. Really? This is how they defeat the Romulans? Who cares? But when I watched this episode out of context, and even when I did my rewatch of Enterprise, when I did watch it in context, I really, it did, I, that's when I first realized that I was being unfair to this episode because I realized that this is its own thing and it's a character story. So now watching it now, w w without watching that two-parter first, just watching it out of context, I can see it is actually good at what it's doing, that it, but it is a character story. It's not an action, suspense, oh, war type story. Even though it resolves the storyline with the Romulan drones and they try to destroy Enterprise, that's not really the point of the focus. I mean, it's the drive of the episode. It's what's driving the plot. But it's not really what the episode's about. The episode is about the Aranar. The episode is about this brother and sister and the tragedy of this brother who was captured who was abducted by the Romulans and used to kill a bunch of people when it that goes against the very tenets of this species or, or this whole culture, which is a very pacifist, nonviolent culture. I mean, they're nonviolent to the point of where they didn't even want to get involved at all in order to stop killing. Um, which I, I think is a bit problematic, but the, <laughs> you know, I buy that as a culture. So, uh, so it's about, yeah, so he was being used in that way, and it's about the sister trying to, who had no idea about that her brother, that this happened to her brother and Archer and Tran, sort of uh, giving them this information, how she was so driven to even go against her own people uh, to try to save her brother. And, and even though saving him did mean basically killing him, uh, because the only way out of this situation was for him to die, but <laughs> she was there, like, she actually thought that was a, um, a better resolution, and, I mean, honest, uh, obviously she didn't want him to die, <laughs> but that was the only way it could go down. The alternative was for him to keep killing people, which actually, to both their minds, was worse, because he didn't even realize because he had been ro lied to by the Romulans and used by the Romulans, kind of brainwashed, I get the impression. And so once he re once she showed up and um, spoke to him telepathically and made him aware of what was really going on, he would rather die. And he chose, that's what happened at the end. He knew the Romulans were going to kill him, and he chose to die rather than to continue this, this uh, violence that goes against everything he, he believes in. And um, I think there was closure in his sister, whose name I'm not even going to try to pronounce. <laughs> but um, that, and so she felt, and she said she was very, it was a very sorrowful episode. It was um, melancholy, I would think, because she was happy to be there for him at the time of his death and she was happy to end his suffering but it's still a sad ending because she lost her brother and to the, and also being discovering that he that he was being used in such a way so in that regard this is actually a very good episode if you look at it strictly through the lens of this being a strong character a very tragic character story of these two uh, the brother and sister uh, in this tragic situation where there was no right way out. If you look at it as, oh, this is a stunning conclusion of how Enterprise defeats the Romulans and the evil germs trying to start war, then it's kind of disappointing <laughs> because it's not very, it doesn't really 
serve that purpose and it's not good in that regard so i think when i first saw this episode i didn't like it i was looking at it all wrong i was looking at it from that perspective because i was just, i was expecting this to be the third part of this epic battle this romulan is using these drones to try to start war when really it's not it really gets into the heart of the characters involved in this situation so when i actually come at it from that perspective i can see it's actually a very strong character story and also uh you get the interactions between shran and the irnar woman i'll just call her that again i'm not going to try to pronounce her name um were very good like the the way that he could relate to her and um how he helped her through this whole situation and then there's, of course is the whole concept of the ENR which of course was invented for this uh, in this season of Enterprise it didn't exist in Star Trek canon before but very little is known of Andorians so they have a clean slate to do what they want which is great uh, I actually think you know, like prequels and other stuff that's taking place in earlier Star Trek should play more with species that aren't developed enough because they have a clean slate to do what they want rather than species that are already well developed because then they kind of bump up and mess with canon if they do it that way <coughs> Klingons <coughs> excuse me <laughs> and Borg <coughs> <clears throat> but anyway, so and, and that's what prequels should do. And that's part of the strength of season four and why season four of Enterprise is. I, I still prefer season three as the best season of Enterprise, but season four of Enterprise is clearly the best example of a prequel ever done in Star Trek. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so. So yeah, the concept of the Irnar is a very interesting one because they're a subspecies of the Andorians who are, I can't remember the exact number of population, but it's very, very small. And um, they have telepathic abilities. Now, when I was watching this episode, I assumed they were just like a different race, a different culture of, of Andorians. Kind of like, you know, how you have humans in modern times. You have... Um, you know, English people, Americans, uh, Chinese, you know, you have different cultures in different places. And so I thought it was kind of in that sort of regard. But, um, no, the all the online material and stuff, the information I've read about the ERNR describe them as a subspecies. So it's, it's considered an entire different species. Uh, so they actually are not Andorians. They are ERNR. They just developed on the same planet and so they're very similar to andorians uh in many regards but they're actually so they're considered a subspecies but really it's a different species kind of like the romulans and the remans which by the way the remans actually appear in this episode <laughs> well they appear in the whole three-parter but it's the, it's the only time outside of nemesis i believe that the remans appeared unless i don't think the remans appeared on lower decks i know they were name dropped but i don't think they did but anyway so, and they didn't appear on picard which surprised me but anyway so far I think, yeah, this was the only appearance of the Remans outside of Nemesis because, of course, the Remans weren't even invented until Nemesis, so they wouldn't appear before it. Um, but I do like that sort of putting them back in the history of the Romulus is another nice touch. But <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so the, the ERNR are sort of described more like that, more like the relationship, because the Romulus and the Remans were meant, were said to be come from the same sort of pool, but they evolved differently on different plants. And the ERNR lived on a much, much colder part, and they've been developed having, uh, you know, telepathic abilities. Plus, they, as I said, they are ridiculously strict and pacifist and being pacifist and nonviolent, which is also very in contrast to the Andorians that are very warlike. And uh, they're seen, more, they're kind of seen as a, they were never clear on this exactly how their culture is, but you get the sense they're sort of warlike, but in a different way than, say, the Klingons or something. But that being war and conflict is very important to their culture. So I can see why it's, it is implied in this episode that the two cultures do not get along and basically have the 
barest minimum of contact with each other so they basically just leave each other alone for the most part but and they have avenues of contact if it is necessary like because they're living on the same planet so there's any issues that um, are relevant to both of them they have means of communication so that they can be aware and work together but other than that I get the impression they just leave each other alone um, and so they are more like a group of isolationist, uh, isolationist pacifists who, uh, you know, are separate from the rest of, uh, Andorian society. Um, and that's a very interesting concept. I think it's a brilliant concept, actually. And again, this is what I'm talking about with them playing with the Andorian culture because we know next to nothing. Also, we learn a lot more about, um, Andoria. Because apparently, and I didn't realize this, and I saw it for, you could see it from some of the shots because you see this uh, gas giant with rings around it. And at first I actually thought that was Andoria, but actually um, doing studying and looking it up, I've realized that they're actually showing the moon of the gas giant is Andoria. Um, and the uh, the gas giant itself is called Andor. So, and the writers said they actually made this up to fix. There was a continuity issue without um, throughout Star Trek because apparently sometimes they refer to the Andorian's homeworld as Andor and sometimes as Andoria. <laughs> so to fix that, they actually made it so there is an Andor and an Andoria. Andor is the gas giant and Andoria is the moon, which I think is a very interesting concept that a whole race alien race that's very highly developed in, in the Star Trek world comes from a moon rather than a planet because you think if there's a lot of moons of gas giants in our own solar system that are very close to supporting life there's Titan uh, around um, Saturn which is said to have an atmosphere and if some and there's speculations that possibly could contain life and there's it's, it's probably the most the celestial body in our solar system that's most similar to Earth. And then there's uh, Europa, a moon of Jupiter, which uh, is has a layer of um, ice, but it's water ice, because a lot of these, you know, celestial bodies in our solar system is like helium ice or gas ice or something, but this is water. And it's speculated that there could be actual water underneath this ice that could contain an ocean that can could t uh, contain life. So I think it's a very um, uh, likely concept that there exists a moon of a gas giant that actually did evolve to contain life. And also, we learn about their world that is it is um, frozen. Because it is kind of similar to Europa now bringing it up since it's, uh, although Europa has its stands could not contain actual you know, humanoid species like it does here, but there's, you could speculate there could be a moon that's similar, but conditions are different where it could contain it. But it's similar in the regards that it is a frozen wasteland. In fact, um, Shran explains that even the Andorian cities are all underground uh, because they, they're all huddled under these geothermic um, areas that allow them to have warmth because their planet is basically a frozen ice planet and to go to the surface is like uh, completely frozen and they you know they have the conversations between Shran and the ear and our woman <laughs> where um, he explains that he you know oh yeah our cities are so warm and 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 Dora they can even get above freezing sometimes <laughs> Um, and that's a nice touch. And then he was talking about being on alien worlds where that there was so hot it was near the boiling point and she just couldn't fathom anything like that. Which does make me think, how could the Andorians survive? <laughs> if, they're, if they're species that were sort of evolved to be living in such a cold environment, you would think if they went to like a place like Vulcan or even like hot deserts in the Earth that they would couldn't would, wouldn't be able to withstand that that they would die from the heat but i suppose this is the future so they could have some like 
a vaccine, not vaccines, but some sort of technology, medical technology that allows them to endure or change their DNA or whatever that allows them to endure. They probably have to be emulated or shot or something. <laughs> I don't know. They didn't get into detail like that, but it did seem odd to me that they would that endurance he, would be able to survive heat uh, for any length of time. But um, of course, this does even more. It is very interesting too because it more contrasts the Vulcans and the Andorians who are seen as almost polar opposites who <laughs> were in conflict during this Enterprise times that um, one comes from a uh, frozen ice planet and the other comes from uh, like a hot desert. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I suspect that's part of the reason why. And I do think, I don't know if any references were made to An Andor or Andoria being frozen or the Andorians coming from a cold place. I'll have to go back and, and think about it or watch other Star Trek episodes, but I don't think so. I think this may be um, the first time they actually came up with that concept. I know that the Breen, or they always talk about how the Breen come from cold. They mention that all the time. Oh, it's so cold on Breen. It's freezing on Breen. But I never remember saying anything like that about Andoria. But I could be wrong. Maybe there was a reference or two about how cold it was. But, um... This is the first time they really delve into it anyway. I think it might be the first time they, they came up with it, but I could be wrong about that. But regardless, uh, it was a very interesting uh, concept and and really helped sort of develop their whole background. And I think, as you said, like the character interactions between... Um, the Air Not Roman and Shran were so good because they come from different cultures but the same planet so they have a point of reference and um, or the same moon I should say but anyway they have they have a point of reference and a, some, a shared culture and the way they relate to each other is is, is really good like it, this reminds me of how amazing Jeffrey Combs is as an actor freaking love especially Jeffrey Combs as Shran uh, knocks out of the park. Jeffrey Combs as Brunt, maybe not so much. That doesn't. <laughs> I'm not really reminded of how good of an actor he is when he plays Brunt, but <laughs> when he plays like Wayun or Shran, like if he's, in other words, if he's given good material, if he's given good stuff to do, he can really, really knock it out of the park. And he really like the interactions you get between him and the Arnar woman are just. So so good they're like so well written and you can really buy it and it's like a natural progression that these two characters could get along so well which leads me to a discovery that i just found out just now as i was researching this episode i had absolutely no idea but apparently in the season finale or the series finale of enterprise these are the voyagers shran appears and he has a daughter and they mentioned that he remarried and he has a daughter. I had no idea that apparently the woman that he remarried was in fact the same character from this episode. And that the daughter that is featured in that episode is half Eonar, half Andorian. So the, the, uh, the online sources even describe her as being a hybrid so that Andorians and Eren are actually different species, so she's like a kind of like, you know, Spock half human, half Vulcan, that she's half Andorian, half Eren are. Um I had no idea. <laughs> I, I get, and they even like, and seeing pictures of her because it's been years since I've saw these or the voyages, and frankly, it's not that good of an episode. Although I don't hate it, it has, and I'm not as enraged about it as most track fans tend to be. Most track fans say it's the worst episode of Enterprise and one of the worst episodes of the franchise, which. I don't think it's anywhere near that. I, but I've already covered that episode. I, in my eyes, it's just averagely bad. It's like, eh, kind of episode. So, But regardless, I never paid much attention to it. It's probably why I never noticed it before. Because I saw a picture of, the, of um, Shran's daughter from that episode. And they do do her makeup sort of make it lighter than Shran's. But sort of more blue than um, the Irinar's. Uh, so she's meant to be sort of a, you know, a mix. Um, I never knew that. <laughs> I never knew that. 
Um, so my first reaction to hearing that, though, is isn't this, like, the girl who appears in this episode, isn't she a teenager? Isn't Shran, like, 30, 40 years older than her? But I looked up the the age of the actress who actually portrayed uh, this character in this episode, and she's actually um, ex one month younger than me. <laughs> she was born the same year as I was. So... That means when this episode aired in 2005, she was uh, 24. So, um, she's not 15, she was 24. Now, granted, this is the actress, and the actress's age is never, not exactly the same as you know the character's age, but I was going off of appearance for their age anyway, and who knows how Erin are and, and Dorian's age anyway. They may age completely different than humans, and that's a whole other thing. But, yeah, I had assumed that she was a teenager, but apparently the actress who portrayed her was in her 20s, so you could assume from that that the character herself would be the human equivalent or whatever of being in their 20s. And Shran, I guess, probably looks like he's in his 40s or 50s. So... That's not as big a deal, especially consider that um, These Are the Voyagers takes place 10 years later, so the Shran and the coupling couldn't have occurred for maybe another four or five years, so she could have been her, you know, the equivalent of late 20s, and he was in his, like, early 50s, which isn't that big of a deal. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it just seemed odd for me at first, but I had no idea that it, that is an interesting occurrence. But um, I can kind of see why though, because they did have, as I said, they had a really strong chemistry uh, in this episode. Although that would mean if they did couple that she pr had to have le left her uh, her society, her people, because I know Shran wouldn't go live with them. <laughs> Uh, because they wouldn't accept him because uh, they had they're too nonviolent or whatever, so she would have had to leave him, which is a bit tragic. But I suppose you know they had their differences in in this episode. I do like how uh, the scene we got where Archer and Shran were trying to take her back to Enterprise, but the Irinar were like fucking with their mind and using their telepathic abilities to make it so they couldn't find the way out and they were going in circles and they, she had to actually convince uh, the ERNR leader um, to let them go. She was like, this is what I really want. And so then they stopped the, the mind games and the exit just appeared. Like, that was a cool scene. Again, that showed how sort of powerful their their telepathic abilities were. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm actually going to appreciate this episode, which I thought I didn't like a lot more. And I already discussed the tragic ending and how she kept, she was willing to go in this machine and she was willing to put herself at, at risk over and over again. And Phlox didn't even want her to go, but she, she was so determined to help her brother. And she, she did, even though she helped him die, that's still helping him because he was in an impossible situation. Um... And um, she was determined to do that, and she put herself at risk. And it was just showed her strength of character, and it's just a really, really good story. Now we got a couple of side plots in this episode. We got a side plot of the the trip in to Paul, and this is kind of uh, this is after you know the trip into Paul relationship fell apart, and 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 the Paul didn't didn't want to be involved with Trip, and this was sort of fucking with his head, and this is sort of, we get a, and it's also showing how he's being sort of overprotective of her, and how that's messing with his duties and his profession, and it's obviously eating him from the inside, so the episode ends with him requesting a transfer to the other um, Starfleet ship, which is just launching, uh, which will become a whole side plot in the next two-parter that they do. Um, which I wasn't a huge fan of, to be honest. But anyway, um, so, and uh, Archer is like, really didn't want to let him go, but he refused to explain exactly why, but he's like, trust me, if you're my friend, just please, I can't stay here. And he's like, okay. Eventually, like, he, Archer put up a big fight at first, but eventually it's like, alright. I think it became apparent to Trip that he still that he really wanted it. That being around to Paul was really 
painful for him. And that's a, that's a really relatable story and something that I think was, was done really well. But here's my issue. I have, I have a huge issue with this subplot in this episode because... Paul is trying that telepathic machine thingy, which obviously she's not equipped to do because she's just a Vulcan. Their, their telepathic abilities aren't as great as, say, the Irinars. Um, and even when the Irinar woman came, it, she still was having risks and had to put her life in danger to use it. So Paul was really in danger because she, she was just not... Her telepathic abilities just aren't as great. Um, so she wants to try it, but Trips kept is kept saying no. Like you can't do this. You're 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 in command now. Like you wait till the captain gets back. And she's like, no, we can't wait till the captain gets back. We have to do it now. And then he tries to go to Flocks and like, can, can we come up with a reason to stop her from doing this? And Flocks is like, well, no. And tries to talk down the trip. Like you're just letting your emotions get the better of you. You're just because you're in love with her. You're not being very professional and you're um you know letting your emotions interfere with your professional decisions and that's basically what the, repeatedly the episode seems to be telling me that trip is letting his uh profession his emotional state and his love for T'Pol interfere with his professional duties and what he needs to do properly which i think is total bullshit actually <laughs> in fact I think by refusing to Paul, and this is why I think I see this as a failure of writing, because the episodes are clearly trying to present a situation as one thing when clearly it is another. Because let's let's put this in other perspective for you. Let's say that on Next Generation, Picard was trying to use some device that for some reason only he could use, but it was putting his life in danger, and he tried to use it and nearly killed him, and he wants to do it again. Riker would put an end to that. Riker would flat out say, no, you're not. And I'm damn sure that Dr. Crusher would back him on that. Crusher wouldn't be like, ooh, you're letting your emotions interfere. No, bullshit. It's the first officer's job to protect their captain. Now, in this case, Archer's on the planet, so she is, uh, T'Pol's the acting captain, and Tucker's the acting first officer. So it's his job to protect her. It's his job to prevent her from taking unnecessary risk. And they made it very clear that this was an unnecessary risk, that she was not equipped to handle this equipment, that it was putting her life in danger, that she wouldn't succeed. And by continuing to try to do so, um, jeopardize her own safety with little chance of success. So no. This is bullshit. Flox's reaction was so insincere. I got so upset over it when he brought up, oh, you're just, well, you're just letting your emotions. You can't perform your duties. You gotta let her go. You gotta let her do what. No, you fucking idiot. She's putting her life in danger. You're the doctor. You're supposed to stop her from doing that. And this Tripp is not letting his emotions. He's actually performing his duties perfectly. He's doing exactly what a first officer should do. Stop the captain from taking unnecessary risks. It angered me so much. And I do see this as bad writing, to be clear. I see this as they wanted to present a situation where Tripp was letting his emotions for Tripp to Paul get the better of him. But they failed to do that because what actually what he was actually doing was what any good first officer would do. As I said, Riker <laughs> has been shown throughout Next Generation to be really overprotective of Picard. Is that because he's in love with Picard? Did they have a romance? No! It's because he's a good first officer who protects his captain. In fact, Trip even brings that up several times, and he's they just dismiss this out of hand. Like, DePaul just dismisses it. Or like, no, we need to do this, blah, blah, blah. Um, no, he, <laughs> she's being irresponsible. And it's Tucker's place to stop her from putting her life in danger like that. Ugh. Pisses me off. <laughs>
anyway, uh, so that that was the kink in that side plot to me. I mean, the whole like the whole thing of of Trip not wanting to be there and her him being around to Paul was being painful. Like I got that. Like, and I thought that ending where he went to Archer that was strong. I like, get this, but I think they failed to build up to that properly. They failed to because it, what the the purpose of that side plot was to portray how it was painful for him and how it would interfere with his duties. But they failed to do that because it wasn't interfering with his duties. He was, in fact, doing exactly what he was supposed to do in his professional position as acting first officer. But whatever. <laughs> anyway, my rating for the ERNR out of 10 uh, is an 8. Extremely good. Um, I think I've given this a 4 in the past, but I really... I really like this episode now. I do think that, like, the Jeffrey Combs is amazing. I love the exploration of the Yernar and, and the Andorians and this relationship. And I think um, they did such... I would dare say they did a way better job of inventing the Yernar than they did with inventing the Remans. Like, I buy that there's a subspecies of the Andorians a lot more than I buy the subspecies of the Romulans. And this, I think, was way better developed and actually makes way more sense. And the Irina are, frankly, way more interesting. <laughs> like, the whole concept of these pacifists living in this warlike society, or separate from the warlike society, but sharing the same world, is a very fascinating concept. And how the two... As I said, the two characters from these... from the same world, but from very two different cultures, but they have that... that common sort of interest of growing up in the same world how they're able to relate to each other like that was powerful and also it's very very tragic the way that she had to um sacrifice her brother in order to save him and like it was a very powerful tragic story um the stuff with the romulans however like that was okay i guess i don't know but anyway uh so that's it for my review of the Aaron R. um thanks so much for watching i shall be back with many more uh, videos on um star trek as well as covering other shows like the expanse uh, breaking bad the outer limits and more so be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all that and thanks a lot for watching